Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I am going to continue chapter 17 by showing you how to use the Hardy-Weinberg principle. This principle is very straightforward. It's usually used to determine the frequency of alleles within a population, but I see that students tend to make very um, easy mistakes in this uh, type of calculation. So I just want to clarify how to work it out so that when you do have to use it or if you do have to use it, um, it's very clear to you how it works. If you've just joined the channel and you're preparing for your major exams, I want to say good luck ahead of time. And I also want to say that I might pause the upload of regular content um, just to do more of past papers and put them on for you to be able to follow. Because my, my belief is that the more you practice past papers, the better you get at biology. So I'll try as much as possible to do a lot of past papers for paper four. That is the first exam you have coming up on the 4th of May, if I am correct. So please look out for those videos. Uh, but for now, let us at least try to get through most of chapter 17. Okay, so the Hardy-Weinberg principle is a principle that's used to calculate the frequency of genotypes in a randomly mating population. And this is very important when we say randomly mating. It's not used whenever you have a population whereby mating is not random, which means uh, mating is orchestrated. In this case, it has to be random mating amongst the population that allows them um, that allows for the genes to mix with each other as much as they can. Um, and usually the frequency is in relation to the total population. So in this case, what is usually done with Hardy-Weinberg is that the population is represented as a number of one. Um, so that means the population can be considered as one, like just it, everything sums up to one. And the denotion of the different alleles will then be in decimals that lead to that value of one. So let's look at what I have put here on the slide. Um, let's assume that the gene for hair color has um, two alleles, big B and small b. And we can say maybe big B is black and um, small b is brown. All right. And so in this case, we can then say the frequency of big B being the dominant allele, so that's for black hair, um, can be denoted as P in the Hardy-Weinberg equation, while the frequency of the recessive allele, which is small b, can be denoted as Q. In this case, then, if we are looking at a population where we have both of these alleles, that is P and Q, the equation then will be P plus Q is equal to 1. Again, remember what I said when I started this slide, that we always denote the number in the total population as 1. So we basically say all of these alleles, when added together, will give us a value of 1. Now, if we are dealing with a homozygous um, offspring, so let's say it's homozygous dominant, Remember, we've said black, that's the big B, is denoted as P for the sake of this equation. So if we have a homozygous dominant, it means that we're going to have P and P. Because remember, if it was homozygous dominant, we would write the alleles as big B, big B. Okay? So in this case, we're basically doing the same thing and saying P times P, and that gives us P squared. Same thing if we have a homozygous recessive, the denotion would typically be small b, small b. And in this case, we can then say that's Q times Q, that will give us Q squared. Now, in the case whereby an offspring is heterozygous, so they get one dominant allele from the mother and the recessive allele from the father, that gives us PQ. So basically, this offspring is big B and small b. But we can also have a chance whereby, or a situation whereby, the dominant allele comes from the father and the recessive allele comes from the mother, and that again is still big B, small b, and it would be denoted as PQ as well, because we're basically multiplying the two. In that case where we have heterozygous organisms that are part of the population, the equation would then be P squared for the homozygous dominant plus 2PQ for the heterozygous plus Q squared for the homozygous recessive, and that will give us a value of 1. Now, these are uh, principles, exceptions to the Hardy-Weinberg principle, where basically you can't use the Hardy-Weinberg principle. And you might get a situation in your questions in CIE exams where they say, for example, this is the population and it doesn't have, um, it's not a big population and rate, mating is not random. Um, can you apply the Hardy-Weinberg principle? The answer to that is no. I've also seen questions where you are asked to state these four 
um, reasons or for possibilities, should I put it that way, where you can't use the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So not possibilities, but basically four situations where you can't use the Hardy-Weinberg principle. In that case, you would say because the population is small, um, if there's selective pressure um, against one of the genotypes, you can't use the Hardy-Weinberg principle because there's no way that genotype will be well represented. If the population is small, the allele frequency is likely not to be high. So it means you can't use Hardy-Weinberg because you don't have a good representation of the different alleles. If there is migration of individuals carrying one of, one, or, one of the two alleles in or out of the population, that also affects the balance of your alleles and can then result in you not getting the accurate representation of genotypes. And if mating is not random, again, that affects how the alleles develop. Because if mating is orchestrated between two specific groups, then only their alleles will be represented. And that will lead us back to the issue of a small population of alleles. OK, so that is why you can't use the Hardy-Weinberg principle in that case. So you can use the Hardy-Weinberg principle to determine the ratios of genotypes in the population. And then you can use it to predict or from those genotypes, you can sort of predict what the next population can be. Um, and in that case, you can do a chi-square test. However, I haven't seen a lot of questions that take you from Hardy-Weinberg um, to chi-square, sorry. Uh, so I'm hoping for your sake that that doesn't come up, but if it does, I do trust that you would be able to do it uh, because it would be laid out for you in a very easy manner. So let's look at an example from the textbook just so you get a feel of how this works. Okay, In this example, it says the homozygous recessives in the population can be recognized and counted. Suppose that the incident of the AA genotype, so this is what a homozygous recessive would look like. Again, recall from chapter 16 how we write um, something that's homozygous, heterozygous, or what's dominant and what's recessive. So suppose that the incidence of homozygous recessives, that's these two small a's, is 1 in 100 individuals, so that is 1%. In this case, um, because it says homozygous recessive, and it's referring to two of the alleles joined together, that means that Q square is what is represented by 1%. And 1% is obviously 0.01. That means to calculate for Q itself, that means for just one allele, because homozygous recessive means that there are two alleles that are recessive. But just for you to get one of them, it means you have to take the square root of 0.01, and that gives you 0.1. Now, from that, you can calculate what the dominant, um, the dominant allele should be, uh, because the dominant allele is P, right? And you know that P plus Q should be equal to 1. Okay, now you've calculated Q to be 0 0.1. So P would basically be equal to Q minus, um, to 1 minus 0 0.1, um, basically. Sorry, I should not correct that. So P would be equal to 1 minus um, 0 0.1. Okay, that gives us 0 0.1. Nine. I hope you're following this. Okay, if p is equal to 0 0.9, then p squared, as you can see here, would be 0 0.9 squared, which is 0 0.81. And so that tells us 0 0.81, if you multiply that by 100, you will get 81%. So that tells us that 81% um, of the population will be homozygous dominant. Remember that p is used to denote the dominant allele and Q is used to denote the recessive allele. If that's the case, then you can calculate what 2PQ is. Um, you can actually say P squared plus 2PQ, and 2PQ represents the heterozygous individuals, plus Q squared is equal to 1. Okay. Now, P squared is 0 0.81. Okay. 2PQ, you can just write it as X and q squared is equal to 0 0.01. And so when you add these two together and you deduct them from one, you should get 0 0.18, which then tells you that 18% of the population um, would be heterozygous. I hope this was clear, but if it wasn't, I have an example on the last slide, which is the next one that I will walk through with you. Okay, let's look at this question that I got from the textbook here. It says a phenotypic trait is controlled by two alleles of a single gene, um, A and A, so big A and small A. 
explain why only the homozygous recessives can be recognized. Now, the reason why it's easy to recognize a homozygous recessive is because they are distinctly different from the rest of the population. Let me explain it to you this way, and I might erase this later when I do the other calculations. But let's say that the color form, let's say hair color, okay? Let's use hair color. So let's say big A represents red hair and it's the dominant allele, okay? And then let's a, say small a represents black hair and this is the recessive allele. Now, why would we easily recognize a homozygous recessive? Remember that for an organism to be homozygous recessive, it needs to have two of the um, homozygous, um, of the recessive allele, sorry. So that means it's going to be AA, which basically would then be black. But in this case, with regards to the dominant allele, we can see that big A, big A would give us red. This is a homozygous dominant. But besides that, we can also have big A, small a. And big A, small a shows that the organism has one dominant allele and one recessive allele. However, because the dominant allele is present, that organism will also look red. So in this case, it is difficult for us when we look at the organisms with red hair to tell for sure that they are homozygous dominant because they could also be heterozygous. Whereas with recessives, there is no other way. Once they come out with black hair, then certainly they only have two recessive alleles and that is why they would show black. This dominant allele here will mask the effect of the recessive allele, so the organism would still come out red. I hope that's clear. If it's not, please reach out to me um, in the comments and I will explain it to you in words uh, or in any other way that I can. Or oh, I might even do like a revision video so that you're able to see it again more clearly. Now let's look at the question that follows. Um, so here it says, calculate the proportions of homozygous dominant and of heterozygous organisms in a population in which the proportion of homozygous recessives is 20%. The first thing you need to do here is write down the equations for Hardy-Weinberg principle. So we know that the first equation is P plus Q is equal to one. The second equation is P squared plus two PQ, two PQ plus Q squared is equal to one. Now we've been told here that the proportion of homozygous recessives, so homozygous recessive is telling us that there are two alleles. Always remember P stands for the dominant allele, Q stands for the recessive allele. So homozygous recessives are 20%, so that means Q square. So they have two alleles basically, that's why they're homozygous recessive. So Q square is equal to 20%. If you consider, if you take 20% to a decimal, you'll get 0 0.2. Okay, so if this is the case, then Q itself would be equal to the square root of 0 0.2. And I have a calculator here that I'm going to use um, just so that we don't get anything wrong. So Q here is going to be the square root of 0 0.2. That means Q is equal to 0. 4, 5. Okay, so we've calculated the frequency of Q just as one recessive allele. This is Q as a homozygous recessive, which means there are two of it there. Then now let's go on with our equation. I'm just going to draw a line here so you can see where I continue from. So we can then say P plus 0 0.45 is equal to 1. Right, and that then tells us that P would be equal to one minus 0 0.45. One minus 0 0.45 is equal to 0 0.55, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So it's 0 0.55 for P. Now for us to get P square, because they say what is the proportion of homozygous dominant? So, I mean, for something to be homozygous, there has to be more than one of it, right? You can't say something, for example, you can't just put water 
in a cup and say, okay, well, this is a homogeneous solution. Of course it is because it's just water. But if you put water with maybe alcohol and they're able to mix with each other, then you say, oh, this is homogeneous. So in the same way, just using the same um, school of thought. So we know that P is equal to 0 0.55. And then we can now work out that P squared would be equal to 0 0.55 squared. And that is 0 0.3. Okay, so it's 0 0.30. 0. I'm just going to put that there. So now that means that in this case, if we multiply that by 100, 30% of our population, so approximately 30% of our population is homozygous dominant. We can then calculate the heterozygous individuals because that's represented by 2PQ. So we just take our P square value, which is 0 0.3. So 0 0.3 plus our 2PQ, which we'll now write as X, plus our Q square, which is 0 0.2. Okay, because remember, we were already given that homozygous recessives is 20%, 0 0.2, and we equate that to 1. And of course, this is a very easy one, because once you look at it, you can see that on the left side, things add up to 0 0.5, and if you deduct 0 0.5 from 1, it would be 0 0.5. So that then tells you that 2PQ is equal to 50% of the population. So that means that in this population, 20% are homozygous recessive, 30% are homozygous um, dominant, and 50% are heterozygous. I hope that was clear to you. If you still find it a little bit fuzzy, please post a comment in the please post a question in the comments. Please don't be shy, don't be too scared to ask for help. Um, even if your colleagues are the ones who respond to you, it is much better than you um, just wallowing in your own lack of understanding and hoping that you somehow walk through it. So I wish you, good luck, you guys good luck again with the upcoming exams. I'll try to do past question videos as much as I can. If you are looking for specific chapters, please use the playlist function. The playlist function is your friend. It has all the chapters. And if you're looking for past questions, there is a playlist called Solutions to Past Questions. So by all means, use that as well. All the best until the next video. Goodbye.